because we've got lots of ground to cover. Uh, I'm calling this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. For the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and this hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv. And it's also broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. It's part of the Council's 35 hearings, give or take, um, long budget review process, um, where we're doing uh, some working sessions, mostly hearings with different departments. Um, and our focus today will be the Boston Public Library. Uh, we do encourage members of the public to testify. So if you're watching this now and you want to testify, um, you can shoot an email to ccc.wm at boston.gov. So that's WM for Ways and Means. Um, you can also send written testimony there, or you can go on boston.gov slash budget dash testify. And there are places to sign up to both come and testify in the Zoom or do a two minute video, which will attach to a future hearing um, so that folks can see that as part of the video. Um, we also uh, take your questions casually through the hashtag boss budget, BOS budget. Um, and we have two dedicated public testimony hearings coming up that are really kind of catch alls for if the evenings are better for you, you're watching this on delay, you want to come and speak. Um, 6 p.m. on May 25th, we'll be having one focused on the Boston Public Schools. And June 3rd at 6 p.m., we'll be having one focused on any aspect of the budget. So uh, so we hope you'll, you'll get involved and um, share your thoughts on the budget with us because, um, you know, the council spends a few months on this because it's really the critical question, you know, how we spend our money is what we're doing in the city in any given year. Um, so today's working session is on the whole set of budget dockets, which is dockets 0524 to 0526, orders for the FY22 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Um, dockets 0527 to 0528, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations and dockets 0529 to 0531, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Um, and I'm joined here today by my colleagues, Councillor Ed Flynn, District 2, uh, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, and uh, Councillor Liz Braden of District 9, and I, I know some others will be joining us very shortly. Um, but uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, as I said, and so um, I'm going to jump right in and, and pass the baton over to David Leonard, the president of the Boston Public Library. Um, and uh, I'll allow David to introduce his team, um, since I know we've got a number of uh, important directors and uh, uh, department heads here with us today. And we really do appreciate all of your time coming to meet with the council. Um, before I pass that over, let me just also acknowledge uh, Councillor Anissa Asabi george at large and Councillor Michelle Wu at large, along with Councillor Andrea Campbell, District 4, all of whom have just joined us. So um, without further ado, David, over to you. Um, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Good afternoon and good afternoon, uh, councillors. Uh, we are happy to be back with all of you again to review uh, the FY21 and FY22 uh, budget arrangements for the Boston Public Library as a city department. Um, my colleagues that are with me today include Michael Colford, Director of Library Services, uh, Laura Ermshire, Chief of Collections, Ellen Donahue, Chief Financial Officer, Eamon Shelton, Director of Operations, and Beth Brindle, who is Head of Special Collections. I know we have a couple of other colleagues that are in the uh, attendee space if we need to call on additional expertise as well, but we're, we're happy to, uh, to all be with you. Um, I have about 10 slides I would like to use as my opening uh, presentation and uh, we'll uh, start, uh, start with that, assuming I can accomplish the screen sharing task um, successfully. Um, so hopefully you are now seeing uh, my presentation. And for the record, uh, here are our uh, colleagues who are either attending uh, as part of the panelist level um, or stand ready to answer additional questions. Um, so uh, the material I'm going to review is in the accomplishments and initiatives document that has been submitted as part of the city council uh, packet. And I want to start with the look back for the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, so I will just go through through highlights. These are not necessarily fully comprehensive or covering every specific accomplishment or new initiative, uh, but give us a flavor and some of the highlights uh, from the year uh, fiscal year that is just ending. 
uh, like all other uh, departments and agencies, uh, our focus has very much been delivering services virtually over the last uh, now 15 months. Uh, we were able to bring BPL to go as our in-person service uh, uh, across all of our locations uh, since June of last year. Uh, we also had a focus on digital equity by increasing the number of hotspots available for checkout, uh, delivering connectivity kits, which would be a hotspot, and the Chromebook, um, as well as at our local branches, many of our staff prepared book bundles and craft kits uh, for, uh, for families and patrons throughout the city. And uh, if you were missing the Central Library in Copley Square, we were able to deliver an online brochure and virtual tour also. Uh, but when we look at our circulation numbers, I think it's really significant to note uh, that the total circulation for FY21 is closing in on 5.2 million um, items or the highest number we have ever seen. Uh, looking at just at digital, that will include a doubling of the digital circulation from just three years ago. And even more heartening was the fact that we had uh, over 77,000 patrons New, newly signed up for, uh, for e-cards to borrow from the library um, in the last 12 months. Additional focus areas included uh, working within racial equity and diversity equity and inclusion more broadly. Uh, the library uh, developed with staff participation um, a statement and commitment to become an anti-racist organization, uh, which was then ratified by the Board of Trustees, uh, as well as both of our, of our union um, uh, leadership teams. Uh, additionally, we were able to make some specific acquisitions in this area, uh, further supported by a $75,000 grant um, from a, a foundation um, that was uh, brought on through the Boston Public Library Fund. And then uh, we have also engaged with YW Boston, an external consulting organization, as our racial equity partner to help us with this work of improving the culture and organizational strategy of the library. As we turn to look at our neighborhood presence, uh, we are thrilled to have seen uh, one project complete, one almost complete, and one um, just coming a little bit behind it. And so with the uh, Roxbury branch, uh, formerly Dudley, the Roxbury branch at Nubian Square, the completion of the Adam Street branch and the pending completion of the Rosendale branch, as we return to in-person service in the coming weeks and months, um, those will be uh, you know, incredible new additions or reno renovated spaces to add to the portfolio. Um, throughout the period, we also um, focused on the underserved and vulnerable communities. Um, where possible, we were doing this virtually and online. Uh, we know that's a model that doesn't work for all our patrons, but we're uh, particularly uh, proud of and happy with the attendance across our Tech Goes Home programs for tech skills, uh, English as a Second Language conversation circles, our homework assistance program went fully online. Uh, we launched our Future Readers Club, and then, of course, our Repairing America uh, series of marquee programs, uh, including a conversation series with some high-profile guests, which I, I personally uh, moderated. The library also was able to use some of the time where we were not open to the public fully uh, to do some planning work. And this included the finalization of a strategic roadmap plan uh, the highlights of which are included in your packet within the initiatives document, uh, which bridges our previous strategic plan uh, called COMPASS to a future uh, more detailed planning exercise that we will take up in years to come. Um, additionally, um, and I know those of you who are perhaps uh, pay particular attention to the history and special collections holding of the library. Now virtually every manuscript and manuscript collection in the BPL Rare Books and Manuscripts Department is findable online for the very first time. Uh, almost 30,000 new entries in our database were, were created, covering an estimated 100,000 individual manuscripts. And here now is a scan of our uh, capital projects. Uh, investments uh, completing uh, in FY22, uh, maybe at the beginning of FY22, 
um, the Adams Street branch, the Rosendale branch, the West End programming study, the Eggleston Square branch programming study, uh, a, the Rare Books uh, renovation project of the Central Library, a, the McKim Master Planning um, programming study, uh, the McKim Fountain, which is uh, ready to uh, ready to go live once we reopen, and a women's locker renovation project also at the Central Library. Capital projects continuing in FY22 will include uh, the Faneuil branch renovation, which was unfortunately a little slow to get started, uh, the Codman Square branch programming study, uh, the planning for both the Chinatown branch and the Upham's Corner branch, uh, as well as a large-scale system-wide fire panel replacement at the McKim Building of the Central Library and a research collections preservation and storage plan. Additional projects that are yet to kick off but are planned now for FY22 include the Fields Corner uh, branch renovation design, uh, the programming studies for the South End and North End, which were unfortunately not able to start over the course of the last fiscal year, and two new projects added to the mayor's proposed capital uh, plan and budget for FY22, which are at the South Boston uh, branch and neighborhood programming study and the facade study and repairs at the Central Library, uh, which we are obligated to do uh, periodically uh, as a form of maintenance. Um, to take a look ahead at other uh, ongoing and new initiatives in the services area, uh, we are extremely pleased to see the provision of revenue relief for the elimination of late fines on materials that are, are borrowed. Um, and then within library services, which is Michael's area, uh, the two big priorities for us as we come out of the pandemic and double down on key areas that we have specialties in include youth engagement and with the workforce development space. In some cases, those are of course overlapping as well. Additional ongoing and new initiatives uh, within collections, uh, our plan will be to complete and reopen the rare books and manuscripts department towards the end of the fiscal year, um, targeted for next spring. Uh, we will complete the collection storage need that was referenced in the capital plan as well as implement some collections security policies and digital preservation plans that were worked on during the pandemic. For the president's office, our focus will be reopening recovery and renewal system-wide, uh, continuing to work with our philanthropic partners and affiliates, um, continuing to support the equity work that the institution has committed to which includes a new position in next year's budget for the hiring of an equity coordinator. Uh, we plan to enhance our strategic partnerships program and with new trustees having recently joined the board, uh, ensure that they are appropriately engaged in the different operations and oversight of the library. In the operations and technology space, we will support reopening uh, we will implement our technology plan recently passed by the Board of Trustees, enhance security posture system-wide, uh, modernize our facilities management technologies, and continue with the capital program execution. Um, some additional um, items to highlight include a $2.1 million grant to revitalize the library's founding research collection, uh, phase one of which will continue uh, 22 into 23. And then overall, um, our goals for library services also include the transition from virtual service to a hybrid of virtual service and full in-person service, uh, which begins real soon, uh, revamping our system-wide outreach plan uh, to reach those most underserved, most in, our, in, in need of our services across the neighborhoods and branches, exploring opportunities to create more partnerships in these priority areas. And our workforce development um, priority is also looking at utilizing the library as an economic hub, uh, a program that we intend to pilot in about three branches. Uh, we'll continue to look to expand the 
more social services offerings uh, through support from the Boston Public Library Fund, uh, which may include the creation of a peer navigator program. Uh, with the city's increased focus on ensuring language access and equitable outreach, there are several initiatives that the library is undertaking in coordination with a variety of city departments to ensure that we too are delivering um, equitable access when it comes to spoken languages. At this point, um, uh, Madam Chairperson, I, those complete my highlights from the initiatives and accomplishment. I will stop sharing and happy to take questions on any of these items, items in the budget packet or other questions you and your uh, fellow councillors may have. Great, thank you so much. Um... Mr. Leonard, and uh, I'll just also note that we've been joined by Councillor Julia Mejia at large. Um, and, uh, and I'll also just remind councillors that um, you do have a copy of that presentation. You also have the library's um, answers to the working session questions we sent over. Um, I uh, will go first. I'll, as usual, defer my questions to last, and I'll go first to um, Councillor Ed Flynn, District 2, um, who even though mentally, emotionally, I feel like the central library is in my district. It is technically, literally in his district. So um, an appropriate first person to start here. Thank, thank you, Council Block. We, we share the central library. Um, thank you, David, for that great presentation and for your team that's doing outstanding work, especially during this difficult um, period. David, I know we've talked um, in the past many times about the Chinatown Library. Um, I know there's a $5 million already allocated um, and the study is underway. Certainly, this is a top priority for my constituents in Chinatown and the downtown area. Um, they haven't had a library in what, 40 or 50 years maybe. And I know you support it, but can you just give me some back some updated information about the proposal for the chinatown library certainly i'm happy, happy to do that and and we think of the central library as being shared by all of the districts across the city so uh, uh we're, we're happy to continue to see that as a split resource um with respect to chinatown we, we agree uh, it has been since the 1950s that the city has had a permanent um branch location in in chinatown and over the last several years uh we're happy to uh, continue making good on the promise uh, made by our uh, previous mayor to bring back the the um, uh, permanent branch in, in, in Chinatown. Uh, we continue to operate a temporary location out of the China Trade Center, um, although that obviously, like all our other branches, has been limited over the last year. Uh, right now, we had been focused on the uh, P12 parcel, uh, but have shifted our attention to the R1 parcel and continue to coordinate and collaborate with uh, both the BPDA and the Department of Neighborhood Development um, to see that project um, move forward. Uh, I believe there is good sentiment in the community that that is a great site for what would all things going well become a new development with both housing and a new branch library on this on the one site and so we're excited to see that continue to move forward uh, at this stage uh, the control of the timeline uh, rests with the bpda uh, who is in the process of uh, uh, either looking soliciting um, developers or uh, reviewing uh, proposals submitted. Uh, once that happens, uh, we would intend to uh, proceed um, with seeking that the community space designation within their project be for a new branch library within the Chinatown neighborhood. Thank you, David. Um, I know also, David, we've also talked many times, we've been at the South End Library many times together um, I know there's a study that's uh, funding for a study. Um, what are we What are we looking for on the South End Library? It plays a critical role in the neighborhood. It's literally across the street from Villa Victoria, down the road from 
uh, Cathedral, public housing, and Castle Square um, on the border of, 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 of Roxbury as well. Um, but what's the what's the latest development on the South End Library, David? Um, so uh, the South End programming study, you'll recall we did some uh, pretty uh, medium size uh, refresh of the interior uh, about, uh, about just, just actually completed right before we went into um, the pandemic. Um, and so I think as patrons return, even as early as this summer, we'll appreciate the enhancements that were, were, were already made. Um, as with all our major projects, we start with a programming study and then with funding uh, appropriated, go on to design and construction. The purpose of the programming study is really to uh, combine uh, the articulated needs of the neighborhood any predictions we may be able to glean with respect to demographic changes, um, as well as ensuring that library services vision um, is well articulated. And then the, the job of the architects uh, who run the programming study is to put that together and make recommendations um, as to whether we would um, renovate in place, uh, as we did with Roslindale just recently, uh, build entirely new on the same site um, as we uh, had have done with the Adam Street branch, or uh, in some cases seek a new location um, as we are planning to do um, for, with Chinatown for obvious reasons, but also possibly for Oppum's Corner as well. So it really is the programming study is the year long uh, work that determines what the needs are and how best to proceed. And thank you, David. And my final question, David, in South Boston, um, the the library study, what do you envision at South Boston um, in, in the library study? What would you like to see done? I, I think it might be the oldest um, branch now in the in the city or or one of the oldest branches in the city. I think given the um, work that we've done, uh, we, we are certainly finding um, that the next wave of branches that needs attention and South Boston is certainly one of those. Uh, again, the programming study will um, be the vehicle, um, just as I said with the South End, so too will be the case with South Boston uh, to explore what the possibilities uh, and needs truly are for the neighborhood as a whole. Um, and as has been our preference in recent programming studies, we also have the opportunity to examine uh, whether something more than a library um, could be built or planned for, for an existing site, the process that um, most recently has been spoken of as exploring housing with public assets, given that that is the other civic need uh, and public need that the city of Boston has identified as in short supply uh, throughout the city. Thank, thank you, David. I have no further comments. Um, the, the only, if I did make one final comment, it would be that I support Councillor Bach on the West End Library, because that's also just across the street from my district and my constituents use it. And I also support the North End Library because my uh, Watertown resident, I mean, not Watertown, downtown, Boston residents and waterfront residents um, also use it. So two, two outstanding libraries as well in the North End and the West End. Thank you, David. Thank you to the library team and thank you, Councilor Buck. Great. Thank you so much, Councilor Flynn, and thank you for the plug yep. for the West End Library. Um, next up is Councilor Michael Flaherty at large. Councilor Flaherty. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see you, David. Uh, just picking up where Councilor Flynn left off the South Boston waterfront, the area is consistently recognized as an area in the city that uh, is most devoid of uh, any true civic space. So um, particularly as the housing population uh, grows uh, down along the South Boston waterfront and the Fort Point Channel area, is there any thought to securing a space for a library in the neighborhood? So in addition to the sort of South Boston proper, the Broadway branch, um, there's been um, uh, huge um, increase in demand for you know civic space but specifically the library i think our, our senator collins had mentioned the possibility of maybe a digital state-of-the-art digital library but nonetheless uh want to get some thoughts as to what you're thinking for the south boston waterfront second question is do, do the, does the library have any sort of uh, staff loss 
while the branches were due uh, were down or closed due to COVID? And uh, what do the prospects look like for refilling those roles uh, in, in today's uh, you know uh, job market? And then third is the programming. You know, uh, do you have any programming um, in the works to help students address the learning loss associated with the past year of remote learning? We've got a lot of kids that arguably have missed out on almost a whole year, a grade level. Um, and I've been uh, very vocal on this, uh, dealing with BPS uh, to increase uh, summer programming through BPS. But I, there's a huge role for BPL to play here. Um, you guys know this lane and the folks that uh, work in your libraries know this lane better than anybody. So I've, uh, I want to make sure that uh, we, as uh, in, in you know, partnership, obviously, with the BPS, we're doing the best we can to get uh, our students, get them back up to grade level. And for those that are at grade level, obviously, continue to help them advance. But can't stress it enough, we're in a global economy, and uh, we've got yeah, competition all around the place. And if we have uh, you know, a, a group, uh, almost arguably a generation of kids that have missed a, a year of learning, uh, I think the focus is on us as a city to try to correct that. And I think our libraries uh, can play a huge role there uh, with programming in the, in the in the local branches. So, and uh, and I'll echo obviously the West End and the North End as well as the Chinatown. Uh, been a strong, staunch, longtime advocate for the Chinatown Library, as you know, David. So, I appreciate all the work that you're doing and your team is doing. So, I'll uh, I'll listen carefully to the answers, and those are my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to David. Yeah, thank you, thank Councillor Flaherty. Um, so, from time to time, with respect to your first question um, uh, on the seaport uh, and the waterfront, or at least that part of the waterfront, um, from time to time we've been engaged in conversations with the BPDA about potential developments and developers who were considering uh, whether a library would be good use of a community space uh, in, in that area. Um, at this time, we do not have an active project to evaluate that further. Um, and, you know, as, as I think you might imagine, um, there's not only the uh, capital costs associated with a new site or a new building, but there are also the operating costs uh, for ongoing maintenance and support of, of a new location. Um, we will plan to at least consider this question during the South Boston programming study um, uh, as uh, the appropriate adjacency. Uh, but whether this matter is better taken up by its own study um, or thought of as the larger footprint of South Boston is a matter that we, we will uh, we'll consider during, during that study. Um, with, with respect to uh, staffing loss, uh, un, unlike many of our fellow uh, libraries across the state and across the country, uh, we were privileged in Boston not to be faced with layoffs or furloughs uh, due, I think, in large part to the city of Boston's commitment to the library and because of our uh, AAA bond rating. Uh, and so uh, we feel good that that was the case. Um, we did see uh, several retirements throughout this period. Um, and when you couple that with the hiring freeze that was responsibly put in place during the pandemic, uh, we could quite frankly have some catching up to do in hiring. Uh, that freeze is now lifted and we are proceeding to fill um, all vacancies uh, once we uh, review job descriptions and um, uh, you know, uh, the individual approvals to move forward. And so we're uh, confident that within several months, we will certainly be back to our normal uh, full staffing model uh, based upon uh, budgetary levels pre-pandemic. Uh, but that will take some time. And so um, that will help with uh, with the fact that we have a staggered reopening plan that we'll be activating in, in due course. Um, there are always specialist positions within the library that are more difficult to hire uh, than others. And as we know from a variety of sectors, the cost of living challenges for Boston um, often affect the entry level positions. Uh, in terms of salary, particularly when when coupled with uh, with, with residency requirements, um, Michael Colford has the bulk of his uh, department 
um, on the front lines of the library service and so can can speak to how that's going. Um, and I will also pass the third question to him uh, with just the following comment that we fully agree. This is why youth engagement uh, writ large is one of our top priorities as we go into recovery. Uh, basically, um, you know, the, our young people are one of the groups that we have the biggest ability to assist, uh, whether it's with formal academic learning and supplemental um, programming, or whether it's the social emotional learning and the um, ill effects of having been uh, fully remote for now 15 months. Uh, Michael, would you add to the answer? Sure, just to um, pick up on your second question, Council of Verity, uh, David, Capture that pretty well. We do have a lot of vacancies at our frontline staff across of our branches, and we are um, we are in the midst of getting those posted and interviewing. We, we, it is fortunate with the first um, few batches, we've seen quite a bit of people applying. So we feel confident that we'll be able to fairly quickly get those um, filled again. With the programming, <clears throat> David's right, um, there are, uh, we have been working with the Boston Public Schools. And um, the, uh, the good news is we finally have solved the library card issue. We think we're gonna be able to get a library card for every uh, student. Um, and then be able to continue that as it moves forward. I think we may have uh, just lost Michael, but um, I will amplify uh, that uh, as we uh, have planned for our reopening strategy, um, activating, uh, continuing to keep our, our youth programming um, hybrid for as long as we can, but then uh, activating our children's and teen sp spaces where possible has been the top priority. So um, this challenge, both around um, uh, youth engagement and workforce development will will be with us for for quite some time. So, uh, you know, we're we're going to continue that as as a as a priority going forward. And as Michael noted, we will be doing part of that work in conjunction with um, with the Boston Public Schools and the many partners that support our youth throughout the city. Yes, I'm sorry about that. I just got bounced out. I'm, I apologize. Um, I, I don't want to repeat anything David said. I'm sure he told you about the um, library card initiative that we're working on. We're very excited about that. Uh, the other thing I just want to quickly mention, we um, are looking at several partners that we've been working with, Babel Vision, Boss STEM, um, around the STEM activities. We have a couple of um, great projects that we're lining up with our children's library staff to get uh, STEM kits out to uh, children across the um, city. Uh, those are coming along together very well. We're also, um, we have, we're have entering, entering, enter, entering into our summer reading programming. So we will be do, doing a lot of programming around summer reading and that type of programming. It, it, we do expect that this summer will be a little bit challenging because we're gonna be looking at that hybrid model that David mentioned and still doing a lot of our programming virtually, but also trying to figure out the best way to do outdoor programming and programming um, in person as as things uh as guidelines become more relaxed so it's really finding that correct balance and moving forward to engage with children for that learning gap thanks michael i see the gavel waving in our direction so thank you thanks so much um, and thank you councillor clarity yeah thank you uh, madam chair thank you david and thank you michael appreciate your attention to detail and the great work you guys do um next up is councillor Braden, and then it'll be councillor asabi george I have managed to uh, escape from the house. I'm, I'm outdoors, so you'll hear traffic in the background. Um, um, question in terms of, I know there's been a delay with the start of the Faneuil Branch Library Project. Um, I think we're probably about six months behind at this point. Um, do we have an estimate? When will the work actually start? And what is the estimated um, uh, duration of the project? Um, just also in terms of our local library, like the Faneuil Branch Library uh, provided support for our local public schools in terms of uh, library cards for our kids and, and reading opportunities. Um, can we get some more details on the summer reading program? And uh, 
as you know, we have a very active friends group at the at the Faneuil Branch Library. Um, that they're continuing to do programming um, on an ad hoc basis. Um, it's just trying to close the loop and um, try and keep something going until we get back into the building again. It's, it's sort of important. The other thing was really with uh, the selection of um, purchasing from local branch libraries. We have had a question about um, the ability of, of the, the branch library to buy um, some uh, books for their own collection that reflects the local culture of the neighborhood. Here in Brighton, we have Russian speakers, we have Yiddish speakers, we have, uh, uh, if you go to Matapan, we have Haitian Creole. There's a, there's, every neighborhood has its own flavor and we, we really feel that our local branch libraries should be able to at least select some of their own collection rather than have it be purchased centrally by people who do not necessarily know the neighborhood. So those are my questions, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. And Councillor Braden, I'll let David answer it, but there there was a bit of an answer on the on the purchasing issue in the working session questions. So. Yes, and I haven't had, I don't seem to have that document, so. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get it over to you. But David, take it away. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so yes, uh, had we known the delay on the uh, capital project getting started at the construction stage would have gone as long, it, we would never have closed in November. So we are in fact looking at a four to five month delay that was not anticipated uh, largely due to um, contract negotiations and some pricing elements and some personnel changes at property at the public facilities department. So all of that together, unfortunately, netted um, several months delay. In my conversations with the new director at PFD, um, they will do their very best to try and make up time with the contractor. Uh, but um, you know that that often is more more is easier to say than to actually do. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, that, all of that paperwork and pricing issue was resolved. And so uh, Eamon Shelton, our director of operations, can add to that. But I think we're um, they are mobilizing, and we're expecting them to be visible um, within a, within a couple of weeks. Yes, uh, thank you, David, and uh, thank you, um, Councillor Braden. So the uh, contractor has actually started; they are on site. Um, the duration is going to be about a year and a half, as David mentioned. I think the public facilities department will see what they can do to expedite that. Um, and um, you know, you'll start to see more activities in terms of. Um, uh, a trailer on the site and, and work going on, but they are, they have full access of the building. We're not there anymore um, and, and they're ready to start working. Uh, additionally, with respect to ongoing uh, programming, uh, I know uh, Michael and Priscilla's team, uh, the staff will, are continuing to do what they can remotely and virtually for the community. And um, I think we'll be able to do a little of that in person as we get back to in-person service, even without, without the branch. Uh, with respect to the ordering question, I would just, uh, seeing as you've asked the question verbally and we, we have responded in, in writing, note that um, uh, it is in fact true that each branch has funding available to it to supplement uh, any particular needs um, that perhaps do not get addressed in a uh, centralized or system-wide selection process. Uh, Laura Armshire can give us a little more detail on that, who's our chief of collections. Um, but uh, you know, there are also great opportunities for all of our branch librarians to participate in um, the purchasing of materials that you know, there are, for example, to use your, your example of Russian materials, um, you know, there are other branches that could also benefit from some of those. And so uh, we really want to strive to have the best hybrid ordering system that we, we can. We have a little more work to do on that front, uh, but really the ideal is where we're taking the strengths of what can be ordered um, centrally uh, or selected centrally and what can be um, selected locally. Thank you. And sorry, um, Ellen, did you want, were you gonna jump or in? Or Laura, I think perhaps. 
Did I just add a little bit on the ordering? I'm sorry, Laura, my, my apologies, yes. No, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to add that um, we agree with you. We absolutely value the knowledge and expertise of our local librarians and what they understand about the needs of their community. And we have a lot of different ways that librarians can participate in ordering. Um, as David mentioned, they have we have a dedicated funding stream that librarians at a location can order for their particular location. They can serve on selection teams so that they can contribute to the broader system wide collection um, and then they have opportunities to um, suggest titles independent of locations to just say you know the city of Boston may be interested in this so we should consider it for placement somewhere um, in the in the city or um, at any location so we we do try to um, balance their opportunities for selecting for local need and also streamline some things that are um, that are easier to handle that we can uh, gain efficiencies in the system and give them opportunities to spend more time really finding the titles that are unique um, for their communities. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Uh, next up is Councillor Asabi George, and that'll be um, Councillor Wu. Um, Councillor Asabi George. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, thank you, David, for being with us uh, this afternoon and, and talking about your work, especially considering the very difficult year we've had uh, in this past, over this past year and grateful to your leadership and to the work of the employees of Boston Public, of the Boston Public Library. You know, my work has often uh, led us to a conversation around how the libraries play a role in supporting many of our homeless residents, those that are uh, experiencing homelessness and, and unsheltered. As um, this, over this last year, many of the resources that our unsheltered uh, Bostonians access through your libraries were unavailable to them because the doors were unfortunately closed. Can we talk a little bit about the, the reopening of of our branch libraries in, in the um, in the central branch and how we are preparing to accept um, you know those individuals back into our libraries and offer some supports I think there's going to be a great deal of uh, trauma that they've experienced over this last year and sort of readjustment to to the new times thank you we, we agree the the role of libraries spaces as safe spaces throughout the city is is vital and one that we look forward to to bringing back in in, in the weeks ahead um, for all of the reasons that you've just mentioned uh, we were able to continue our partnership with um, with Pine Street Inn throughout the year that we were closed and continue to support um, the outreach navigator that's funded through uh, the Boston Public Library. So that person was certainly able to continue working as a member of their team and continue um, interacting with individuals uh, in and around Copley Square primarily, but, but other areas too. Um, that's a program that we will be uh, rebooting and revitalizing as we, as we return to in-person service um, and have Pine Street Inn's uh, commitment and partnership to do that. Um, additionally, uh, while it was only a small gesture, our Books for Boston initiative did deliver uh, some reading materials um, earlier last year uh, to many of the um, sites such as Boston Healthcare for the Homeless and the uh, field hospital at the uh, convention center when it was operating as well. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's nothing like being in an actual library and um, and being able to access the the staff and the skills of the staff in person. And um, as uh, the mayor announced, um, as Mayor Janey announced um, a, uh, a week ago, um, June will be the month that the Boston Public Library system uh, reopens. We will be doing that in a in a staggered and initially limited way, um, uh, in order to to do so uh, safely and to begin returning services um, to all of our neighborhoods across the city of Boston. Uh, the governor um, allowed for a more restrictions to stay in place for those that work with vulnerable populations and early education providers. And we don't yet have updated guidance for uh, municipal buildings, uh, which is coming imminently. And so all of that will allow us to uh, support a staggered and limited reopening 
um, until we can get back to uh, the full service model that everybody is used to and loves. Um, so we can't wait to get back to in-person service. We know our patrons uh, want us in our spaces and we're looking to begin that process um, in early June. Uh, great, thank you for that. Sorry, I just want to find my unmute button. We um, last year you established some open office hours where unsheltered residents can find support, including housing counseling, recovery services. We you know utilize the the work of um, sorry my own timer. We utilize the work of um, some social workers to support through um, a partnership with Simmons. Have we? You know, I know that obviously that that closed down. Are we going to re-engage or restart those office hours? I'm going to turn to Michael for some details around the answer to that question. Hey, Michael. Yes, um, yes, Councillor Savi George. That's uh, we are. We did continue to do some of that virtually where possible. We worked with a couple of partners, legal services, and some um, for for housing issues and for rental uh, eviction issues, and those were actually fairly well attended. So that was really good to see. We are currently um, our health and human services specialist, who is the person who spearheads those uh, programs, is currently vacant and it's about to be posted externally. So we hope to fill that position very quickly. And then at about the same time, hopefully we'll be uh, ready to start holding those office hours again. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thanks so much, Councillor Sabi George. Um, next up is Councillor Mejia. Councillor Mejia. Oh, sorry about that. I'm not worried. I'm on mute. Um, hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. Um, I just have a few questions. I'm I'm curious. We asked this during our working session, and I'm just curious um, if we could just talk a little bit about some of the hours of operation and how it's determined per branch, like. For example, in the Roxbury branch, it's closed on Saturdays. And given that it's one of the few open spaces available in our community, I'd like to know how we can utilize these branches more intentionally about creating space for people to just be. Um, then my second question is in general, how can we open up these library spaces for more um, evening community events hosted by community members? For example, um, in our campaign office, we opened up our doors to um, you know, art galleries and, uh, you know, places for people to be able to showcase their talent. And I know the library is supposed to be quiet, but maybe in the evenings we could open up some of these spaces for use like that. And then the last question is, um, during, um, we've been conducting these budget pop-ups in barbershops and hair salons across the city, and many of who are immigrant owned with clients who don't speak English. In each space we asked who uses their local library and very few of these um, patrons raised their hands. And I'm wondering how can we think creatively about being more intentional about bringing in all the different kinds of people to their local library. So it's not just the usual suspects. Um, great, great questions, Councillor Meher. Thank you so much. Um, I'll ask Michael uh, again to step in and address the hours of operation uh, question. I think as we as we return to our normal hours, um, many of those get get addressed straight out of the gate. But I think there's more work to be done, uh, and then I'll come back for another comment. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, as we uh, start to reopen for public service again. Um, we will definitely be looking at our returning our Saturday hours. It's a particular challenge right now, as we mentioned before, because of the number of vacancies we, ha we have. But as those vacancies are filled, we'll be able to expand back into our regular hours. Um, I know David's going to go back to address some of your other questions, but I did just want to mention about the um, service to uh, communities that don't speak English. We have a great department, relatively new department of library community learning, who part of their mandate is to do a lot of outreach into these communities. and. Before the pandemic shut us down, they had just started to do this work. They had one particular day, they spent the day going to every single business from um, Jamaica Plain into Rosendale and uh, we're speaking to many people who don't speak English. We were fortunate enough to have a couple of Spanish language speakers in that team. They've been starting to offer uh, programming in Spanish to, to, to do better outreach to um, communities across the a uh, city that don't speak English, and we hope to do much more of that as this department grows. Um, thank you, um, uh, Michael. Um, I, I would simply add 
um, that each branch, at least under normal operations, has either one or two evenings, where it is open um, until 8 o'clock. Now, I think your question we could uh, run with and say, could there be more evenings or could it be a little bit later? Um, and that's a function of our staffing capacity right now, um, which ultimately translates to, to budget concerns. Um, certainly, as we go forward and get back to full staffing, I think we could then address if uh, further expansion would be warranted. Uh, maybe not at all neighborhoods, but maybe there are particular neighborhoods where, where that would be of benefit. Additionally, we have um, about 130,000 Boston adult residents that hold Boston Public Library cards. Now, you don't have to have a library card in order to simply come in and use a branch. Uh, but even if that number is more conservative, uh, it tells us, I think, there are many more people in our neighborhoods who perhaps don't know everything that the library has on offer or don't understand all of our services or rely on their memories of using the library as a child. And uh, there's a lot more on, on offer. And so uh, we're working with our uh, communications team uh, to do outreach at the marketing level to couple that with the type of outreach that our library staff do that Michael has already addressed. In fact, in the um, proposed operating budget for FY22, there are two new positions for our communications department, which will address some longstanding capacity challenges we've had in simply getting the word out. Um, some of that is word, word of mouth locally, uh, but some of that is also um, uh, from the more formal marketing point of view. And so um, I would like nothing more than to reach a point where every resident of Boston knows that the library is there for them, whether they whether they choose to use us or not. And so um, thank you very much for the for the reminder that there's work to do on the outreach and marketing front. Thank you so much, David. I really do appreciate you and your entire team and all of the work and look forward to continuing to partner with you all um, you. to move it forward. And thank you, Councillor Bach. Surprisingly enough, I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, all right, then I think it's time for mine. Um, and, uh, and I'm very grateful to the library team for the extensive answers um, to my questions, particularly, uh, as you know, I, I take seriously, I have a PhD in history. I used to spend a lot of time sitting in archives and libraries. And I, you know, I'm very proud of our status as a research library and the collections that we have. Um, and it's really important to me that that's, you know, something that we continue to invest in, both being best in class in terms of care of those collections and their access to for professional research researchers, and then also thinking about ways that they can be more accessible um, to the to the public in general. Because I think that, like, you know, seeing seeing historical items, having the context around them, asking your questions around them can be a really important part of the kind of like learning journey that that libraries are really invested in both for kids and adults, frankly. So um, so I'm really grateful to see that we're hiring that we've hired a lead archivist as of um, last year. I have talked pretty extensively with the Boston Research Center um, and I'm, I'm excited about about that collaboration and, and would love to um, would love to just give you a chance to expand a little bit on these things, less for me now that I've read these answers and more just so that, sorry, that's the end of Councilor Mejia's time. Um, uh, more just so that folks who might be watching this at home kind of know about what we're up to and what we're doing. And then, and then I did appreciate some of the context around, um, I mean, it sounds like we're still, you know, we've, we're going to do this two hundred thousand dollar assessment to figure out what we need in terms of storage. That's still like you know a ways away. The the, the revamp of the third floor still sounds a little TBD, um, but I get that things are moving. So I guess maybe I wanted to give David, you and your team, a chance to talk a little bit about the efforts on this front, just because I think it's such an important piece of your portfolio. Yeah, I, I think. Um this team over this five year period is in large part revitalizing our uh, care and custody work around our special collections holding. 
Um, and I, I'm going to turn this to Laura and Beth in a second because uh, I'm really just going to stay at the high level. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, the ultimate goal here is not simply about improving the physical storage and intellectual control and knowledge of our own collection, but it is activating it in a way that serves our educational purpose more broadly. Um, and so, you know, that we have to treat, whether it's the John Adams collection or um, our Shakespeare holdings, you know, as vital to our history as, say, the preservation work that we've done around the murals at the Harriet Tubman House in the South End more recently. And so these things at one point were local history and will become so as historical remnants largely into the, into the future. Um, but there's some specifics that we can tell you more about as well. Uh, Laura or Beth, who would like to go first? I'll start and then hand it over to Beth. Um, so we've had the opportunity and pleasure to focus on a few very distinct areas of our collections and spaces over the last several years. Um, we're wrapping up a renovation to our rare books and manuscripts department. Um, a few years ago, we completed an inventory of our print collection. And so now, um, as you mentioned, our storage study, we're looking at how we can add that in and address our entire needs of our collection. So we're doing a study now on the space needs to understand the space that we have, the um, the best practices for the storage of our collections and what space we need to make sure that we are preserving them for future generations. So that study is going to be the, the first step in giving us all the information we need to, to build a plan for our storage for the next 50 years or so. Um, so we're really excited for the opportunity to bring a lot of the work that we've done together and have it apply to all of our collections across the board. Um, and I'm going to ask Beth to talk a little bit about her team. She's done some incredible work uh, recruiting some amazing people and, and building up special collections to, to tackle some of the, um, the backlog of work that we've had and, and bring these collections to light. Thank you, Laura. Following on what Laura said about team building, I really think the growth of the last five years has been in building expertise in recognition of areas where we have had a collecting strategy or we've had collecting um, for decades or and generations, but not had this the expertise and the stewardship to make them as accessible as they should be to the public. And so uh, I think the hiring of the lead archivist and the development of the library's first dedicated archives team um, is certainly one important step. And the first priority is really stewardship of the collection, the preservation and the description of the collections that we have that are in our care. Um, one of the major areas of focus for us right now is uh, creating a user-oriented online catalog so that people can discover those holdings. I think one thing that we have very much uh, seen a growth in in terms of um, interest from the public is in these unique materials that archives, which you know, really represent records of people and communities and neighborhoods, are are un it's unique content that we hold that tell stories that aren't told anywhere else. And so, I think for us, the work it has uh, been focused very much over the last year and will continue to be uh, for the next. You know, for the years to come, um, really making that information described and available so that people can use them. We're excited about the opening of the rare books and manuscripts department because that will hold our special collections reading room, which will service all of our special collections, again, for in-person public service. Uh, we are looking at working with um, organizations and uh, you you spoke about uh, the Boston archivists group and this this sent this uh, group of peer organizations that really more so than at any point honestly in my career at BPL are working collaboratively around the city um, to showcase not only what they hold within their individual institutions but throughout and I think that's been very much a mission of digital Commonwealth in terms of our digitized collections we're certainly look at because for a researcher and for students and for teachers you know they are looking for content and I think it's really incumbent upon us uh, to 
figure out how we get to a place where they can find it the most easily. Um, Michael has been very involved with, in particular, uh, the Boston Research Center project. And Michael, if you want to speak a little bit about that specifically. Sure. Um, thank you, Beth. Uh, we were very fortunate to be part of this grant at the Boston Research Center to create a position of community history and digitization specialist, really to take all the amazing work that um, Laura and Beth and their teams have done about digitizing our special collections, our archives, and, and making them accessible, and now start working with the public to really engage with those collections. And naturally, this all happened just before the pandemic, so then when everything shut down, we had to pivot because the original intention was to hold these community meetings and to start talking about the ways we can use these um, special collections in four distinct communities, East Boston, Chinatown, South End, and Roxbury, um, in collaboration with the Boston Research Center with the communities directly. But it has actually turned into something really quite astounding and the work they've been doing with the, um, some great projects, including the Harriet Tubman House that David mentioned, um, the Chinatown um, Digital Collections Freedom Trail, their large trail that they're looking at, uh, East Boston Social Center, a lot of really wonderful communities that working on oral histories, partnering with various organizations, and we're, we're already planning for ways we will continue this work, um, extend the grant, and then bring back the piece that was going to be with the communities and working with community meetings in our branches to really uh, have communities engage with these collections. So it's, it's a very exciting project. That's awesome. I, I would further add, if I might, that um, there's a narrative here that brings all of these threads together, which when you include the collections of storage assessment and the McKim master planning, um, that really continues to support this narrative of, yes, balancing our interests in revitalizing special collections with um, the work that we do every day, whether it's in social work or reaching out to the most vulnerable or traditional traditional library services. And so, um, I don't. I would. I'd be remiss in not trying to knit that together. But also in in noting that while the city's budget continues to be very supportive. Um, that is supplemented by uh, funding from uh, the donors of the Boston Public Library Fund. We heard about the $2.1 million um, uh, item that will support the revitalization of the research collection, the founding research collection of the BPL, uh, which was joined by the associates of the Boston Public Library, who um, in their own right also support many of the positions that now have been activated within uh, within special uh, within special collections, and that's before we were to even talk about the Leventhal Map and Education Center and the special map holdings that they care on our for on our behalf, um, or any of the amazing uh, friends groups around the city who also do their part in bringing supplemental um, revenue to the table. Um, this is a budget hearing after all, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the dollars. <laughs> yes, no, we always try to, in fact, that was my, my next question was sort of about um, kind of long-term funding trends, because it does seem like, I mean, it does seem like the budget this year, there's a, there is a, a bit of an uptick on the state side. Is that something you think might represent a sort of continuing trend, or is it a weird moment? Like, what's what's happening there? Um, I think we're seeing, you know, year three of a new appreciation um, around our uh, elected officials statewide for the role libraries play in their communities, um, as well as particular respect for um, the Boston Public Library as the library for the Commonwealth in the budget line it shares with the Massachusetts library system. And so I, I think there's an appreciation there. Uh, but as Ellen can tell us, we, we are nowhere near the levels that we had before the last two true financial crises statewide uh, of 2001 and 2009. That's correct, Councillor. Um, up until the early 2000s, I think we were about $8 million for what, what is now called Library for the Commonwealth. It decreased again in the 2007-2008 fiscal crisis, but then has come back a little bit over the years. It was kind of steady into the mid to late 2015-16. But over the last number of years, we have seen it gone up. Um, Library for the Commonwealth, we're expecting right now, um, I think it's... It, with the new um, Senate Ways and Means number out, I think we think that'll be as high as uh, 3.4 million. 
where he also carried state aid at about 752,000. And based upon the House and the Senate numbers that have come out more recently, we think that could be over 900 each, 900 from each of those, Got both it. the House and the Senate. So that's probably a pretty good number at, at this point because they, they'll agree on one of those numbers to put before the governor. Right, right. So unlikely to go down. Correct. And our, our budget this year for the city, we started working on in November. Uh, November was a very different time than May is now. And so um, our requests were, I think, moderate and uh, very responsible. And we we're glad to see what has been included in this year's budget. Um, it will probably take us, as we said earlier, three to six months to get back to our normal staffing levels. Uh, by that time, we'll be facing uh, down next November's budget planning cycle. And I think we'll be able to see um, you know, how have patrons returned to our branches and our services. And, uh, you know, is the demand returning at a level that is... Um, uh, would surpass what we were before the pandemic. Um, so in some ways, uh, there are additional investments that, um, if my instincts and our analysis is correct, uh, we would want to put before uh, the city in next year's budget, FY23. But we'd, we'd like to get through FY22's uh, budget planning cycle first. Yeah, no, fair enough. But I hear you. Yeah, I mean, when you do it, I did the quick math of the envelope. It's like the library's budget on the city side operating budget's gone up by about nine percent over the last three years and my instinct i have this number somewhere else and i can't just quite rem remember it but my instinct is that our city average overall is a little higher than that not a ton higher but a bit higher so yeah. i think a lot of the other unions are in contract right now councillor we're out so our folks haven't gotten a cola since 2020 so that deflates our number a little bit these this last year or two well um are uh, actually you're very not alone in that basically oh, okay. all, basically all of the city unions are out right now um, all right. the only ones that aren't are fire which goes out on june 30 and schools which goes out on in august so everybody else is out at the moment um but anyways uh yeah i just wanted to um sort of track that a little bit um and sorry, I did, David, can you actually tell me where we are on the McKim third floor? Like when? Um, Eamon, correct me on the timing, but I believe we're wrapping up the programming study at the moment, a programming study slash master planning exercise. Um, so we'll hear, uh, we'll get copies uh, in due course over the summer from the, uh, from the architects. And uh, we will then review next steps. Um, you know, I think there are some really exciting possibilities being examined, um, which, uh, you know, to, to recall the project, focused primarily but not exclusively on the third floor of the McKim building, the former home of uh, fine arts and music and other special collections areas, but also the exterior plaza, uh, which we um, anticipate being in better dialogue with Copley Square as these two projects in the city uh, move forward. Um, but it is indeed also looking at other parts of the McKim building as well. Um, and how we proceed, uh, I think, will depend on um, how ambitious the ideas are, how costly they are, and um, what the appetite might be across um, city budgets, possibly even state budgets, and private fundraising for support of these bold ideas. Um, David, just to add, um, so we're about three quarters of the way through this master planning process. Um, we do have a community meeting uh, we're planning for June, and we hope to finish that, the, the study or the master plan in fall of 2020. Um, 21. And so, as David said, it, that a lot will be determined with that plan. And so, this is something that perhaps could be done in chunks or sort of one big project. Um, and uh, just to add one other sort of really important program element, we're um, looking at accessibility uh, throughout the entire, um, you know, central library or more specifically the McKinn building. So, uh, a, a lot to tackle through this project. Great. And, Eamon, will you just make sure that I get invited to the community meeting that's coming up absolutely, absolutely. everyone everyone's invited but we'll make sure yes no i know i just i just some things make it onto the calendar and some don't so we would love to have that and then um 
Can you can you speak to? Um, we did have a couple of questions about the fact that the overall BPL capital budget is lower this year than last year. Um, yeah, David. Or yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's largely due to those large projects that are wrapping up. So the rare books renovation, um, the um, Roxbury Branch, Robbinsdale, and Adams. Um, so the number of projects is, is pretty consistent, um, but they're just in different phases. So in this upcoming fiscal year, we'll be doing mostly programming studies and um, design projects, although we, we will be working on reopening some of those other projects I just mentioned. Uh, we expect that in future uh, budget cycles, um, as we move in, move those projects into construction, the, um, the authorization will be higher. We, we, we hope. Um, the, the, for example, on the branch front, uh, you know, having had uh, three and a half branches all in construction is much more costly than five programming studies um, happening. And I think uh, Faniel may be very well be the only uh, branch in construction for the duration of the of the fiscal year, leaving aside the work that we're we're talking about at the central library for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's fine. As long as it's sort of regular cyclical, yeah, stuff. I think people just want to make sure we're not pushing back, stepping back from any capital plan. Um, on the West, I guess, so back on the West End Library, and as Michael noted, I was at that meeting, and I, I don't need to recap that meeting here. I think we're really excited about the housing on public assets and just the opportunity for a much bigger library services capacity at a really heavily used location. Um, I guess there's always some nervousness, uh, like, you know, as a, as a district counselor, it's like we're authorizing this capital budget that from the budget perspective only has 50,000 for next year in, right, for, which is the other half of finishing the programming study. And especially given the fact that we are looking at housing with public assets, which we all know has a longer runway, um, you know, would, would hate to finish programming study this June functionally, pay the balance of the bills in July when you get the new budget and then not touch the West End Library for a year when we know it might be that longer runway. So I'm just a little curious and I, I realize that this is partly a PFD question, but just like how how you're thinking about that, David, timing wise. Yeah, I, th I think that, that those are those are correct instincts for sure in terms of the balancing act that has to happen. Um, uh, this, like there are, there have been, I think, six on deck for consideration as housing with public assets. We, we know from Fields Corner is going standalone library instead of continuing with the possibility of housing. Um, I think it's safe to say that the West End has a higher likelihood of uh, being a mixed use project than not, um, although I'm, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to prejudge the outcome of the study or the feelings of the community or uh, the recommendations. But for a moment, let's assume that it is. Um, that means that it will probably be done in conjunction with the BPDA and the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, so the short version of this is we won't need our design money until much later in the cycle than we normally would if it was just a standalone branch going straight from programming study into design and then construction. And so I don't believe we need to worry about a gap in FY22 appropriation. Um, the work, if we go down that path, there will be work happening on the BPDA and DND level uh, rather than at the library or PFD side of the equation. We do, we will need it in FY23 or FY24, uh, but not necessarily in FY22. Right, no, that makes sense. And it's just a good reminder to me to watch that funding on the other side. Um, to make sure that we make that forward motion. Um, and it's, be... it's the two to watch are the Upham's Corner and the Chinatown, probably Chinatown more earlier than um, Upham's Corner in terms of the um, cyclical, not cyclical, but the um, sequencing nature of the funding needs and uh, which agency has lead for which stage of the overall development, um, because that one of those is likely, is more than likely being will become the model for how this gets done um, efficiently. They're, they're, they're the two of the six that are running slightly ahead of the, the others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's helpful. Um, and, and I think I've already expressed to you just uh, wanting to be as helpful as I can on that. I did a fair bit of affordable housing um, work in my prior life and uh, 
definitely think it's an exciting thing for us to sort of nail the model down on. Um, I, I, and I guess, again, I'm not going to belabor at this time. Um, I mean, you know, you know, I'm excited about this commemoration commission thing I've proposed and, and a piece of that is, and you know, one of the reasons I'm excited about the special collections work is because I do think it's super important to steward the collections you have. I also just would love for the library to be doing more of that kind of connecting between BPS and, and the city archives and kind of like thinking about having a, an educational curriculum for the city as it were, right? Because I think that the place where, where just residents of the city who are not school children are gonna encounter things, it's very likely to be their branch library or the central library. Um, and, uh, and so as we think about kind of um, uh, themes and, and work we can do um, to, to really sort of like focus in on Boston's history and make it more accessible to folks. I, I really hope the BPL is gonna be a leader on that front in the coming years. I, I, we, we, we do too. Um, and I, I think um, a lot of that work becomes much easier uh, once our rare books and manuscripts um, holdings return to their new space um, uh, in spring of, uh, of 22. Um, they are in a secure offsite location right now. And so uh, it's been, um, for the work that we're talking about, working with the physical material um, or replicas thereof is, is really the better approach. Um, equally, uh, you will have noted the hires in many leadership positions within special collections. And um, you know, uh, the team is tired of me probably saying, look, the Leventhal Education Map Center, uh, Leventhal Map and Education Center um, has a model for taking those special collections holdings and using them as artifacts uh, for second level curricula development. Um, and the challenge to us, I think, is how do we do something equivalent uh, with our other with our other holdings? Um, for example, a map is a great tool to teach geography, math, history, social studies. Um, so too can our anti-slavery abolitionist materials be in their own way. And so I think um, over the next several years, you will see us do much more of that, uh, of that work across all of our, of our holdings. And I think I caught a comment in your statement that I 100% agree with that what we have to do is not think of this as a visit to the central library where this happens, but as um, something that branches out to all of our neighborhoods and can be accessed at the local level, um, which is where many of our patrons, that's, that's what they think of as, as BPL uh, in their lives. Absolutely. No, and that's really, yeah, that's, I mean, I, I just think we have to, I mean, you know, and again, I don't, they don't need to co op your hearing for it. Like, I, I think that the idea of getting the history of the city told expansively in ways that it's not all about just the Freedom Trail and kind of specific, in the same way, like, it's like you should encounter the history of the city and the collections of the BPL in your branch library. And there's some cool opportunities there. So, more, more um, work and coordination to come, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I think, um, shoot, I had one more question on this that I'm completely blanking on right now. Just the, so the lead archivist and then what's the sort of full strength of the archive team expected to be? So we have currently, uh, one lead archivist and one processing archivist. So it is two. A, a mighty team of two, but we are looking at opportunities to expand that um, in the coming year. So our hope is that, that that team will grow in the short term. When you say that, with, with what money? So there are um, a variety of funding sources. One is through city funding. Um, another is through our philanthropic arms, uh, most specifically the associates. Just because obviously if we were going to fund another position through the city, then now would be the time to ask. <laughs> so just flagging that. Um, and then um, this is just a quick question on the, the Boston Research Center. And um, and I had had the opportunity to, to um, chat with your new hire there. And it seems like really great work. 
um, if, if, if I've recently been contacted by a South End organization with some community archives, like who's the right person to talk to about whether that could fit into that conversation? Yeah, so um, I assuming, I'm assuming that you spoke with Dory Klein, the community history digitization specialist, so she would be the right person to Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, we talked maybe now it's six or seven months ago, like it was right, it was, yeah, back in the fall. Um, but uh, yeah, this recently an organization came to me with this, and so I thought a little distant bell went off that I might want to reconnect on that. Um, all right, well, um, I think, David, I'll give you the chance to say any final words, um, but I think that those are all of my questions and the council's questions. Um, and again, I really do want to thank you for taking the time to answer our working session questions in advance. Yeah. Um, and so after you say a final word, I'll then, I'll then turn over to public testimony. We've got some members of the public who've been waiting patiently, but. Yeah, we me. were appreciative of all of your support. Excuse me, um, <laughs> one second. Either bad networks or pets. I think it was a pet in this instance. It sounded like a pet. Definitely in this instance, it was his dog. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, while we're waiting for David to come back, it was lovely to meet and see you all. Um, and uh, not really are grateful to you all for the work. I mean, people, people are antsy to get back to the libraries, but it's because they're loved. Um, and who, sorry, amongst the leadership team, who's in charge of the reopening piece? That's all of us. Everybody. <laughs> we're all working on it, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, and I know we're all waiting for the municipal building guidance. I just think, um, yeah, I mean, I just think it's, I think it's all accelerating faster than people necessarily expected. And we have to kind of keep pace to some extent. But David, you're back with us. Sorry about that. Yes, it was a pass rather than a um, uh, telecommunications problem. Um, so I was just going to uh, just offer words of thanks for your support for this budget and for your um, it can, all, all of your uh, questions and comments and support for the branches and the capital project in, in particular. But um, we look forward to, once this is uh, approved, um, executing on uh, the operating budget as we normally do, but also the new initiatives contained uh, there in it, as well as additional ones that are being supported by by external funds. So thank you, Madam Chairperson, and uh, we'll stay on to also hear uh, public comment. Great, wonderful, yes. And I should also say that I didn't bother you on the Parker Hill elevator because I haven't heard anything about it recently, but I haven't heard anything about it recently because the library's been shut, so. <laughs> you know, if I hear about it in the new fiscal year, even though we've already approved the budget, I will I'll place a call. Um, but thank you, thank you all. Now I'm gonna go to public comment. Um, first up, I will be Alyssa Cadillac, then Carolyn Rubin, um, then I'll be going to Chu Huang. Um, so, uh, all right, Alyssa, you're up first. Great, thank you. Um, just trying to get my, uh, say every, everything working right. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank now you. we can see you. Yay, double, double there. Um, so good afternoon, Madam Chair and fellow counselors. My name is Alyssa Cadillac. I'm president of the AFME 1526 local. I'm proud of the work my members have performed over the past 14 months. Our custodians have kept our facilities clean. Our carpenters have installed protective barriers all to keep the staff and the public safe. They were the first to return to in-person work and have not stopped. Our library assistants were the next group to return to in-person work and have stepped up, all while being afraid for their own health and welfare. And when we welcomed patrons into the Copley branch, again, it was the library assistants who met that challenge. And our clerical team ensures materials move around the system, providing resources across the city. It has not been an easy 14 months. Some of my members got sick, lost loved ones, and everyone has suffered in one way or another. And through it all, people did their jobs. Today is about next year's budget. Without previous support to increase our custodial numbers, some locations would not have been able to operate during the pandemic. This year is no different for staffing. We need more AFSCME positions to support our daily operations. You see the libraries put three budgets, new positions in the budget for approval at the same time I found out yesterday we're eliminating one. 
took over three months for the library to tell me that. Were they trying to hide that? You've heard the statistics. We need more clerical staff in our shipping department and more library assistance to provide and support frontline services across the city. The library in the city need to dedicate funds in this budget to address the air quality in our existing branches. We've learned a lot about air change rates per hour and the effect they have on the spread of airborne viruses. 14 of our branches have an ACH well under the range of two to six, six recommended by ASHRAE and some have non-working units. This must be addressed to make them safe for staff and the public, especially as we begin to allow public back into all of our buildings, of which all my members are looking forward to. I also hope the council will recognize the hard work and dedication our members have shown over the past year when it comes to our collective bargaining agreement. My members have demonstrated the value they bring to the city of Boston, and we hope that deserves to be recognized with fair wages and benefits. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa. And thank you for waiting. Uh, and, it was a uh, lot shorter this time. <laughs> I, I know, well, everyone, true, it was shorter this time. We didn't lump it in with BCYF. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Oh, I think David does as well. <laughs> um, uh, next up is uh, um, Carolyn Rubin, and then it'll be Chu, and then it'll be Wen Yin. Um, and then um, I don't have a, a clear um, listing for Jianhua on the thing. So just that's just a flag, Chu, if, if there's another account, to let me know. Um, but uh, next up is Carolyn. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have been uh, the chair of the Friends of the Chinatown Library since 2013. Four of us are here today to emphasize the importance of David's budget request for the Chinatown Permanent Library. My Chinese name is Hang, which means celebration. I want to start by celebrating the over 30 youth who started and sustained this campaign, which began in 1997. The countless Chinatown residents, allies from our other neighborhoods, and those in the city who have been our internal advocates, especially Councillor Flynn. While there is still pain, suffering, and hurt to be collectively healed from this long campaign, I see hints of poetic justice in this story. Since 2018, when David and his team started working with us through the temporary branch, we have forged a strong partnership to keep the process moving forward. David and I talk often about how this library can symbolize and embody hope, transformation, and love for this neighborhood and the city. Chinatown is excited about the opportunity to build our permanent branch on a parcel of land, R1, that is currently a Tufts parking lot, a legacy of both highway construction and Tufts institutional expansion, a dark period of Chinatown history. Quoting from a Sufi text, darkness is real and it carries a force and energy that we need. Like darkness, like chaos, darkness carries the energy of creation. What offers us the balance with light, the potential for unity, and a pathway forward for this land? Tani Lee, our beloved elder, who passed away last year, who was of Toysini descent, grew up on Hudson Street, worked for the BRA during this period. He named this parcel of land R1. R stands for residential. The intention of that land was always for res residential use. A mixed use building with a public library and affordable housing gives the city the opportunity to restore the original intent of that land, thereby shifting the narrative of who belongs here in Boston. A public library, a home for our elders who need free spaces to socialize, our youth who desire safety from anti-Asian racism and a home after school, families displaced out of the neighborhood who come back for cultural education and social services, new families of different races and ethnicities moving in through affordable housing who understand what community means and appreciate the working class nature of the, new, of the neighborhood. Our original library, the temporary one and the future one can always be a place where everyone can come and find a sense of belonging, just like what pub public libraries are meant to do. Tani taught me, Chinatown is not a victim. We never have been and we never will be. R1 is an open parcel of land. We have the opportunity to bring in the power of imagination in partnership with the city. Build this building with the vibration of grace, dignity, honor, and watch our community continue to flourish. Restore this land back to its original intention. 
Our next speaker, one of our tireless, fierce, yet humble advocates is Chu Huang, co-chair of the Chinatown Residents Association. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Hei. Um, Councillor Bok, I want to let you know that um, Jim Hua is on the One webinar. second, Chu, you're just getting, you're getting a ton of feedback. Is there another device that's playing the hearing in the room? It is. Yeah. I was wondering if I can like screen share her. So then, because um, she is tuning in onto the webinar, and so if later on you could give me um, yes, screen yes. share access, that Absolutely. will be a way for me to bring her in. Yeah, we, can, we can do that. Great, thank you. Um, let me just uh, quickly with my with my testimony. Um, thank you so much, Hang. My name is Chu Huang. I am an active resident in my home, being Chinatown, Boston. Growing up, I relied heavily on after school programs and school field trips to go to the Boston Public Library. I'm looking back wondering why my family did not take me there. Here's a few reasons. One, the fear of getting lost to find BPS and language barrier to ask for directions. Two, constantly working for six to seven days a week and not and, and having to juggle familial responsibilities. Three, even if arrived at BPL, will there be multilingual staff or some form of guidance in how to utilize the resources there? It is due to these experiences for why I am very motivated and have this sense of urgency to make things better so families after me won't have to encounter these barriers. As I am grateful to have this opportunity to share my testimony, I can't help but to think about the many voices who are not able to attend or have the access to directly speak with you without having an interpreter or encountering technical difficulties. So I ask, who is missing a seat at this table? Who cares about the public library just as much as me and cannot make it here? They are the working class families, the single parent households, the children of restaurant workers, residents who speak in another primary language that is not English and et cetera. Over the decades of surveys and campaigning, the community has undoubtedly shown that the need is there. With the positive relationship between the Boston Public Library and Chinatown community, it is extremely critical for the Chinatown Library to have community governance and centering resident decision-making in the process. This is about Chinatown and the people in this place and how people from all backgrounds can make a form of connection with it. Chinatown residents and stakeholders such as teachers and community organizers who have preserved the neighborhood's history, talent, and resources can collaborate in partnership with shaping the Chinatown Library. It's been way too long and with loose structures and systems, it's left out residents in shaping the neighborhood and public spaces. And I really hope that this can be the moment to make that change. Um, with that said, I'd like to pass the mic on to Wen Yin, a youth leader who continues to advance the permanency of the Chinatown Library. Thank you. Thank you, Chu. My name is Wenyan Kao. I'm a student at Wellesley College, a resident of Chinatown and former youth of Asian Community Development Corporation's youth program. When I was younger, my dad would always walk me to the copy library because I loved and still love borrowing books from the library. And we would always go on the weekends because it took 40 minutes to travel to and from the copy library. And we just didn't have enough time for that on the weekdays. This library is important because Chinatown doesn't have a library. Everyone wants a library for Chinatown, so we've been painfully fighting for it for 60 plus years. Having a library would save Chinatown community members so much time from having to go to the copy library. I want access to resources, books, and technology to help me with my studies in college without having to leave my neighborhood. I want an indoor space where I can hang out with my friends, a space that serves all ages. The fact that we are able to build a library on parcel R1 gives me hope because R1 is just an empty parking lot right now. And that's exciting to me because it means that we can build the library however we want it to be. Our library can be anything. The city needs to get us, Chinatown, a permanent library that is just as good as the libraries in all the other neighborhoods. And I would like the city to do so out of love and care for our community and to really believe that our community deserves the library. I hope to see a big, well-resourced permanent library in Chinatown in the near future. Seeing a library built in Chinatown would make me feel hopeful in the city 
because it would show me that the city is looking out for my community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jianhua, a Chinatown resident. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear her and see her? Uh, we can see her. I don't think we're hearing her. We're hearing you. Uh, 自從在政府起建了文化生活都帶來很大的影響和損失。到今日為止,整個波士頓唯一是華埠一個沒有社區的圖書館。So given the building, the building of the highways of I-90 and I-93, the Boston Chinatown Public Library has, has been long gone, and it's been an extremely huge loss um, in the Chinatown community and also surrounding neighborhood residents. And given this impact, it's really important to think about like why, why, why is Chinatown the only neighborhood that doesn't have a public branch library? Uh,是解決的時候的啦。一定要由政府嚟到解決。因為你是政府徵收的地起九十同九十三號高速公路的。咁你應該由政府嚟解決翻依個問題。但係呢,我哋一直爭取咗十幾年。到到而家呢? 都未能夠得到這個解決。我不知道政府到底有沒有聽到我們的聲音。有沒有將我們的訴求擺上議事日程。我希望有一個明確的答覆。Given this problem um, of not having a library in Chinatown, I believe that this is our local government's responsibility to bring it back. Um, we hope that the government can stay true to their words and be the ones to correct this problem. Like um, Sorry, I just want to make sure I capture the last two sentences. I am not sure whether our local government officials have been listening to our voices. Um, right now, I would really like to get a clearer response as to how this problem can be corrected and hope that um, this issue can be resolved. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think, um, I think I can confidently say, obviously you heard uh, uh, councillors um, Flynn and Flaherty both, both pushing on the Chinatown Library. Um, as a kid who grew up in Bay Village myself, I'm fairly, um, I, I've always thought there should be a Chinatown Library. And I think, you know, we're all excited to see it in BPL's capital budget this year. So it's, a, it's really a, a long time coming as, um, as you all said, but I think something that enjoys strong support on the council. Um, but I really appreciate you guys all joining us um, and, uh, and thank you too for translating. Um, and uh, I think with that, I've got a few people who are not signed up for public testimony, but are in the attendees section. Um, so if any of you, Baolian, um, Hyun, Tiffany, if any of you are hoping to testify today, if you could raise your blue hand. 
um, or uh, otherwise indicate you're hoping to speak. Um, seeing none, I think that uh, I think that's everything. So I think um, thanks again to the BPL staff for joining us, um, and much more importantly for all the work that you do every day, and for the I know hard work that you're doing thinking about the the heavy lift of reopening. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, with that, this hearing of the Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you.